Hey everyone, uh, Kevin Kermis with All Things Career. Exceptionally excited about the hangout we've got for you today. I am joined by Martin Yate, uh, New York Times best-selling author of the Knock 'em Dead series. And for those of you who don't know Martin, the Ultimate Job Search Guide, his kind of perennial book, is in its 27th edition. Uh, it is the I'm sorry, 29th edition, cornerstone of the. I swore I was going to commit all these numbers to memory. <laughs> nah. I'm going to do it. I'm not looking down to my left. I swear. Uh, <clears throat> it is the cornerstone to a 17 book job and career management series that has been published in over 60 languages. 63 to be exact, and Dunn and Bradstreet, amongst others, call him simply the best, just about the best uh, in the business. See, Ugh, my memory is fading. Martin, welcome. Welcome. There's not a job for you in the movies, but then there wasn't for me. Yes, right. I'll just, as long as I can read off those cards in front of me. Yeah, so, I'm someone <laughs> holding the prompt. Right. <laughs> well, <clears throat> Before we dive in, uh, for those of you who have been on our Hangouts, you know how they work, uh, but I'm going to take a quick second turn it over to Kelly Gurnett, who is our Editor-in-Chief, who will walk you through the paces on what to do, how you can communicate best with one another and with us, and then we'll dive right in. Kelly. Hi, everyone. Uh, two ways that you can interact with us today during the Hangout. If you look below the video feed on your screen, there's the chat box, and I'll be in there looking at any questions that you want to leave us. We'll try to get through as many as we can. Um, also, if you're on Twitter, we're using the hashtag ATC Hangout. So as long as you use hashtag ATC Hangout, you can also send me questions there, and I'll add them into the queue. OK, awesome. Well, Martin, let's dive right in. Um, the job search. Uh, over all the editions of the Knock 'em Dead series that you've done, you've clearly seen some some massive changes. For those folks who are who are watching us, what would you say right now are you know the three key things, three four key things that that folks need to be doing to be successful in the job search today? I think the biggest uh, uh, misconception people are still laboring under. Uh, regardless of their age is, you know, all you have to do in America is get a degree, start at the bottom, work hard, be loyal, and over the years you'll get gradually increasing responsibility and wages, and at the end of the day you'll retire with a house in town, a house at the lake, and golly gosh, bombing at the end of the dock will be your boat. And that hasn't been true for 30 years. But at home and in our schools and colleges, that message of career management that that's all you have to do hasn't changed. The facts of the matter are, and uh, a very important man in my life by the name of Bill Yate, who's my dad, told me when I got to about Martin, uh, 19, he said, Martin, you're not a kid anymore, you're an adult, and I'm going to tell you the hard truth. No one really cares what happens to you now. No person, no company. Whether you make a success or a failure of your life, it's up to you. And that's a very important lesson, and especially when we, uh, when we apply it to this very, very uncertain world we're living in. Uh, the old rules of career management simply don't apply, and we have to learn not only everything new about resumes and job search and interviewing, but the, the very concept of managing your professional destiny. This is all new territory for everyone, and the biggest mistake we make is not to recognize that to think that the old ways still work, to think that, hey, I'm a guy, I'm 45, I know how to do things, I know how right. to write a resume, <laughs> it just simply doesn't work that way. So have you seen, because this is a trend that, that I, I feel like has become more and more pronounced, and, and I've definitely watched it in the last, I guess I'd say 15 years, is that as, as we have access to the internet, we've got more connectivity, it requires us to be able to stand out more, um, and, I, and I think that's kind of a given. You know, it's just become a yes. much more crowded yeah. space, and there are a number of studies on you know how distracted we are, and, the, and you and I were talking before we went live how you can get hijacked by your inbox. So, you know, all that said, going back to what you what you were talking about before, when we know that relationships are are the cornerstone to to I, I think being successful in life. Period. Doesn't it then become really important to understand what's important to other people and those individuals who are going to hire you? Yes, uh, absolutely, Kevin. Uh, we also have to be careful not to get hijacked by the flavor of the moment. Uh, 
sticking with the flavor metaphor that the, the great chef Julia Child said, moderation in all things, including moderation. I think you just channeled her. <laughs> <laughs> That's what this sounded it's, like to me. <laughs> it's an easy voice. <laughs> um, but we, we, we tend to go with the flavor of the month. Something new comes out and we, we think we can do it. It's, it's like networking. Let's have a lots of contents. And I know people with 10 times more connections than I do, and they're not making any money. Right. They're not making a living. Uh, th there's a guy we were coaching last year, and, and I couldn't believe when I, I spoke to him six months later, he was still unemployed. And this was a major, high-powered, successful global marketing guy. And I looked at what he do, what he's doing, and he proudly told me he'd made 163 videos. <laughs> and what he was doing in his job search was what he enjoyed. He wasn't using a balanced approach to job search of the of the methodologies and the tactics and the strategies that worked. He was doing what was easy and enjoyable for him. And we have to be very careful in a job search and in management of our careers that we do what's right for the long term goals for the end game rather than what feels good this afternoon. You know, there's so much talk about follow your passion, which, um, <laughs> I'll, well, you laughed and I was trying not to roll my eyes. And, and I, you know, I'm, I'm all for loving what you do. And, and I think there's an inextricable link between being successful and loving what it is that you do. Um, and it's, for lack of a better way to put it, it, it's not sustainable to do things that you don't like doing. Uh, there's, at some, at some point you'll, you'll peter out. <clears throat> but but all that said, so so going back to, to this guy, let's use him as an example. You know, 163 videos. What what should he have done? I mean, if you, if you put all that content out there, I I, I mean, it just it, it makes me want to sink down in my chair and maybe cry <laughs> to think about putting all that together and then it's not doing anything. But what if somebody out there is sitting there going, okay, you know, I I want to get out there. I want to leverage whether it's social media whatever the case may be, what would you tell them? What advice would you give them in terms of crafting their message and, and where they need to be focused? Well, we'll do Julia Charles again. Moderation in all things. <laughs> you know, what he did was 163 videos and, and, and he'd done over 200 blogs. Uh, and, and what he had done was he, he caught this message that blogs work, that tweeting works, that the videos work. And he could do those and there was no rejection involved in doing them. And basically he was just advertising then. Now, you, a little bit of everything can be useful, uh, but when you go overboard and do too much of a single activity and not enough of the other productive job search activities, there are two things happen. Go over the mark a little bit and you're just not getting interviews, you're just not getting traction. Go over the mark a lot and everyone wonders, is this guy in marketing or is he a video right. blogger? <laughs> And there's a que there comes a question about what you do. Uh, so in this, in this part of social networking where we have a responsibility to share some content, we want to be careful about what we curate and what we say, that it doesn't uh, muddy the message of who we are, what we do, and what we're looking for. Yeah. So, you know, it... Um I, I feel like there's a there's a tendency for folks to first of all try to follow the path of least resistance. You know, you could you could talk about Maslow's hierarchy and how under you're you're kind of under a full on assault when you when you lose your job and you're you're down looking at, at base needs, you know, and your amygdala, your lizard brain's kicking in and and all those things. But <clears throat> when I when I hear somebody who who does that and and you know goes out and goes all in on on blogging or tweeting or, or whatever the case may be, you know, A, to your point, it's, they're becoming quasi antisocial. You know, all, all of this stuff, yeah. in, in, in my mind, like, number one, well, well, even before be becoming antisocial, it's, I'm looking for tactical fixes without a strategy. Mm -hmm. So it's, it, you know, it's, well, I, I've, I have to be. I have to be on Twitter. I have to be, and I'm sure you've had these conversations that people say, I have to be here. You don't have to do anything. You, you know, you, quite honestly, no I one's mean, you. right? But I, I always think, I think back to being a headhunter, and the the metrics we'd use, we, you know, the end state was the outcome that you're looking for is an interview, because without an interview, you're not getting hired. I, I've never seen it happen, 
and and even when people know you, you're still going to have to go through the interview process. So everything needs to work backwards from that, and it, it's it's not it's not even not feasible. It just it, it defies common sense to me that you go all in on something without testing it first. You know, is your audience even there? You, you know, Kevin, uh, for, for those of you that don't know, Kevin and I have never spoken before. We've communicated a little bit, but we've never spoken. I, I had this impression that he was one of the people who kind of knew what he was talking about. And as soon as he said, when I was a headhunter, um, headhunters are the guys on the pointy end of the boat. That's where I started out. And, and we spend our whole lifetime finding people for jobs, putting them together, and sitting in the middle of the desk between candidate and, and hiring manager and negotiating those deals. And if you're looking for career advice, you go to people who once were headhunters, in my book anyway, because they, they, they have a better knowledge of what goes on. And, and Kevin, you were saying about nothing happens without making contact. I don't know if it's ever been done since, but in the early 80s, when uh, uh, I was still a headhunter, we did a study of a, a small company, and we took all the telephone calls that people made and received between deals, whether it was calling their dog or their parrot or their wife or anything, all <laughs> calls made, all calls received. And we discovered, and this is going to astound you, uh, people were making 500 calls between deals. So that led us to say, you know, you've got to reach out and make contact. If someone doesn't want to talk to you, they're not going to reach through the telephone and punch you in the nose. But the point is, the only two yeses that are important in life are, yes, I want to hire you, and yes, I want the job. Everything else is a no. So the quicker you get to the yes, the better. And that means reaching out and making contact. And the fourth and final step of that in the, in the way I, I approach these things is um, uh, you pick up the phone and you make a call. You reach out to the people because, as you so very rightly said, nothing happens without conversation. Well, you know, it's <clears throat> along the same lines, one of the things that just breaks my heart <clears throat> as well as it frustrates me <laughs> to no end, are when when I will hear and 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 listen to folks who are are focused strictly on how they can use social media too, and 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 the two is is t o and then dot dot dot, and what they're what they're getting to is how somehow or another they can hack or streamline meeting somebody versus um, or or hack or streamline getting to an offer. That, that somehow or another they're going to be able to yeah. leapfrog. Everyone's looking for a shortcut. Right. So, yeah. you know, the, the reality is is that the way you should be looking at social media is that I, I'll give Twitter as an example because I, I actually love Twitter, and Twitter has allowed me to connect with people that it would be harder for me to do it through an inbox, be harder to do it through a telephone call, and I can also see what they're interested in because I see what they're, what they're sharing and what they're tweeting about, and I can have a, a more relevant conversation quicker. But the reality is all it is is it's a catalyst to be able to get on the phone or meet them in person. Yes. Yeah, it's an entree. It's an easy entree. Absolutely. So <clears throat> so for and and then we'll jump into questions here in a second, Kelly, because I, I, I know there are a lot. Um, in in coming back to to what it requires to be be successful today in terms of the job search, advice that you have for individuals who feel like they're being, okay, they're, they're listening to this and they're saying, I'm doing that, I'm doing that, I'm doing that, and, and they need to navigationally kind of change their course. What would you tell them they need to do right now? Okay, step number one. I, I've been at this way over 30 years. I've been doing it my whole life. You show me a stall job search, and the first thing I want to see is the resume, and invariably the resume isn't relevant to the needs of today, and it's not relevant to the job. Most people write resumes, and they write a reasonably honest history of everything they've done. And it's not going to be found in database searches. It's not going to pass the recruiter's six-second scan test, and it's not going to talk intelligently to a manager. You know, resumes have to, you know, what's the first lesson you and I ever learned in business, and everyone here today, I'll tell you what it was. Hey, son, the customer's always right. And you know what the second lesson we learned was? Right? You tell me if I'm wrong on this. The second lesson was, so find out what the darn customer wants and sell it to them. Right. <laughs> right? And we apply this in life, but we don't apply it 
in the most important document that we're ever going to own, the creation of a resume. We don't get inside the customer's head first. So number one, you've got to go back and make sure the customer's right, the, the resume's right for the job you're after. Number two, look at what you're doing in a job search. Now, if there was one perfect way to do a job search, I would have written about it in the last 30 years, and we wouldn't be speaking because I would own the Virgin Islands. Right. <laughs> <laughs> there isn't one you mean one over, one over from Necker yeah. Island. <laughs> I'd let you come over once in a while. Thank you. That's, well, that was my next question. So, <laughs> but, but there isn't one way. There's a, there's a number of ways we can find jobs. Now, I, I talk about five, right? These are the five ways that generate the most responses. Number one, and, and this is what I call the social network integrated approach to job search. Number one, there's responding to job postings. Yeah. Number two, there's posting your resumes on, on relevant job banks. Number three, there's direct research and approach. Identifying a geography in which you can commute and work and finding all the companies in that target geography and responding to their job postings and responding to hiring managers directly. Four, approaching headhunters, as many as you can. And fifthly, integrate social networking in every aspect of this. How does this apply very quickly? You respond to a job posting and they say, upload your resume, you do that. Next thing you do is you save all contact information for that company and you look for someone to send an email to. You want job titles for people one, two, and three levels above you because those are the men and women who are going to hire you. Um, there's a lot of ways we can find that. We might get to it in, in questions, how we find hiring managers' names. Yes. Um, so we send an email. Uh, if we get a name, it's very simple to get an email address. Corporations, there's only six ways they use. It's Martin Yate at, Martin dot Yate at, Martin at, Martin underscore Yate at. Once you have the cover letter, you can send it to all six vari six or seven variations in, in a minute and a half, and the ones that don't go through bounce back and no one's any the wiser. You have a mailing address. No one gets mail anymore. You and I were talking 10 years ago, Kevin. We'd be saying, hey, there's this cool thing called email. You've got to use email. <laughs> well, now we're going to be contrarian to use an investor's term, and while everyone's using emails, Get a big flat, uh, whatever size that envelope that's about the size of a laptop, stick your resume in it flat, send it. If you can afford the $4.50 pop for a priority mail, send it in one of those. I guarantee you, because no one gets mail anymore, right? We all love a bread from these damn computer screens. It will get opened. And yeah, the fourth step. It's a lot step, easier to stand out. Yeah, the fourth step you and I were just talking about is. Pick up the darn phone and call them. Call them first thing in the morning before the help gets there. Call them at lunchtime when the help's gone to lunch. And call them right at 5 o'clock when the help's already left. That's when you're most likely to get people and never, ever leave messages. It's not for them to call you back. It's for you to call them. That's great advice. So I, I'm sure that there are a number of questions that have come in <clears throat> with, with what we've talked about so far. Kelly, uh, you want to fire some questions up for us? Sure. First one. What do you suggest for the long-term unemployed to get their foot in the door? I've heard one manager say that all the good people already have jobs. How can we counter this bias? Martin, what okay, are you thoughts? Uh, yeah, I'm too yeah. old. Uh, <laughs> just some, you know, I write books. I can talk a lot when I get the opportunity. Uh, just some highlights, and, and I've covered the first one. Go back to your resume. Is it properly focused? If you were, um, uh, let's say, a director of for many years, but you've been out of work for 18 months, you're not going to get a job as a director. Think of it from the other side of the desk. You're a hiring manager. You've got five candidates to be a director. Four of them have been doing this job for the last five years and are doing it today. And the fifth one is a guy who hasn't done it for 18 months. Who are we going to hire? It's not going to be number five. You may have to pull... You may have to pull the title back a bit. Number two, you've got to rewrite the resume. Number three, you've really got to examine how you're going about the job search. Uh, this is a, I, I mean absolutely no offense to anyone. We have a coaching business and a resume business, and I talk to people at all levels from the, you know, the, in the last three months, people in the top half dozen folks at Microsoft to people fresh out of school. 
And what I'm really talking about here are guys in the 40 plus group, but it does apply to women as well. There's a feeling that when you get to this age, especially if you're a guy, you're meant to know how to do things. And that's why you never see a guy after 35 doing anything new. They never take up new hobbies, right? We don't like to make idiots of ourselves. Right? You actually should. You, you learn more by making mistakes. So they think they don't know. We coach people. When I do coaching sessions, they get my books, and I tell them to read them and, and do this. And then they ask questions. I say, you haven't read the books, have you? And they say, oh, yes, I have. And I say, no, you haven't. I know because of the question you're asking. And uh, then they say, well, I scanned it. I kind of think I know how to do this. But you don't. It's all changed because of the Internet. Everything you ever knew about job search is different. It's changed. It's new. You've got to go back to school about how you do it. The third thing is, is how you interview. You've got to look at how often do you blow out at the telephone interview, at the first interview, at the second interview, at the final interview, and look at what you're doing wrong. Are you getting interviews and blowing it, or are you not getting interviews? And depending on your answer, that affects where you have to put yourself back to school. Now, you can follow Martin Yeh. He's brilliant. He's a genius. He's a New York Times bestseller. But you don't have to follow me. What you can't do is follow 20 people. Find someone who you think gets it, knows it, that you can take their advice, and if they tell you something that you really don't like, you'll still give it some credence because whatever else they're saying makes sense. Find a system, put yourself back to school for a week. You know, what, what Kevin and I do ain't brain surgery. You know, I did it. I'm stupid. I can like you just two points above room temperature. You know, you can learn how to do this. It ain't brain surgery. You just got to dedicate a little bit of time. And I tell people, if you're stuck, this is what you do. You make yourself a promise. After this career attraction podcast, you take the rest of the day off and you go out in the fresh air. And you walk and you go to the beach or you walk by the river or you walk in a park. And you look at your life and you say, do I want to change things? Do I want to change the trajectory of my life in the future? And if I do... I have to make changes at the ground level. I've got to go back and re-educate myself on how to execute a job search from the very beginning and throw out all preconceptions I've been carrying with me up until today when I attended Kevin Kermy's uh, Career Attraction podcast with Martin. Back to you. You know, I, <clears throat> one, one of the things you brought up in there, and, I, and first of all, I, I, I totally agree. I mean, it's, it is... It's disheartening to me to hear some of the advice out there that, that just says, you know, flat out, that this is going to be easy. There, there, there's nothing easy about it, and there's particularly nothing easy about it when it comes to changing habits. Um, you know, there's decision fatigue. There, is, there, there are psychological and physiological studies showing that it is, it is physically draining to try new things, to, to, to be able to push yourself to change habits, to adopt new behaviors. Um, so make no bones about it. You, you know, it's... it's it's not going to be easy. But one of the five things you talked about, and, and this is something that I think a lot of people take for granted, is the interview. And I just wanted to share kind of anecdotally, the, the first search firm that I started, we, were, we carved out a really knacky niche for ourselves, really wacky niche for ourselves. I <laughs> know, uh, uh, seriously, it's, uh, it's not even 1230. I know. <laughs> so we were placing headhunters with other search firms so you know we're, we're sitting oh, here nice. dealing with and it was it, it was it was enlightening but one of the things and one of the one of the most frustrating friction points we had with any candidate and and ultimately with clients as well was the interview you had folks like you and me who said and, and I tell candidates this all the time and I tell folks who go through our program and say well you know I don't I don't need interview advice I mean would you pay for interview advice if I had to go interview with a company tomorrow <laughs> you bet I would I, I would not assume for a second that I interview well I, I would not assume for a second and it may seem contrary to the advice that's given but the reality is it's a perishable skill and I would watch headhunters who were at the top of their game go in and absolutely blow up in an interview because it is fundamentally different when you're asking the questions it's totally different when you're coaching somebody else um, you know you're emotionally removed from the entire event you, you don't you don't have to you don't have to have a story you're just listening for how to pick apart what somebody else is saying and the message they're trying to get across 
So, you know, all, all of this is to say, and then I'll, I'll push back to Kelly for a question. It, it I think for anyone watching, whether you're watching this live or you, you come across this a year later and you're watching it, if you start to feel friction and you start to pull back because some of this stuff is work, that's when you need to push forward because that's when your competition is backing off. And and it does take work and you do have to remain a student to the game. And like you were saying, Martin, I mean, you've got to, you've got to measure this stuff. You've got to see what's working. and and. Pick one thing. Don't patchwork quilt all this stuff together because it doesn't all work together. Take a system, execute on it. Can I add, add, add one, one thing to what you're saying? If I had to give one piece of advice about interviews is that jobs exist for two reasons. Number one, they exist to make money for the company in some way, save money for the company in some way, or increase product productivity for the company in some way, sometimes all three. The second reason they exist is because given that job title, that job exists to, um, uh, to be peopled by someone who knows the geography of the work well enough, and they not only have the technical skills of the job, but they know the geography, they know their territory well enough that they can, number one, anticipate the problems that are about to come over the horizon every day of the week, and by the way they do their jobs, prevent them from happening, and secondarily, when they do arrive on their desk, they've seen them before and they know how to solve them. That means that all our jobs are jobs about problem solving, and the more you can focus what you say, your positioning, and the questions you ask at an interview around the problems your job is there to identify, present, and solve, and to find inside information about how they're dealing with that at that company, the more you're going to stand out from the rest of the competition. Back to you, Kevin. Absolutely. Well, Kelly, what have we got next? Sure. Next question, and there were several people who asked this actually, is how to overcome the age discrimination factor. Um, people mentioned having innuendos in interviews. Someone actually was asked if they knew how to use a computer. How do you, how do you handle that? Buy my anti-aging cream. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, aging sucks. You need, was, to, you need to stick with Julia Child. <laughs> <laughs> you know, I, I used to be so young, I wore glasses when I went on television and interviews to make me look intelligent and older. <laughs> and the next thing you know, you're gray and your hair's falling out and you've got six chins. Um, age discrimination, there's a lot to be said on that. And we are two-thirds of the way creating a book on age discrimination in jobs that so should be out in about four to six months. Um, you have to be concerned about your appearance and I, I saw those questions earlier and there were some comments about you know, got to get rid of the stuff that dates you like having a 15 year old cell phone. <laughs> you, you have to be up to date. Uh, there is also a tendency, the older you get, the more you are likely to be interviewed by a younger hiring manager. And there is a temptation when you're in a job search, especially when it's stretching out, and especially when you're threatened because of age discrimination, it does exist, is to spend, invest yourself in showing, if I was the candidate, Kevin was the hiring manager, in showing Kevin that I can leap tall buildings with a single bound, stop speeding bullets with the palm of my hand. And he's listening to me and thinking, oh my God, listen to this old dog. I'll never be able to manage him. He's going to be a real headache. You know, there's a real chance that you're intimidating the hiring manager. You want to stick to what are the issues of the job. Now, the other thing is, and there was this question about, you know, I, it, it, I see it in their eyes or they make comments or, you know, if they ask you a question about age, it's illegal. And you can say, that's an illegal question, Kevin. You can't ask me that. Whoop, there goes your job offer. You know, if we met socially, any of us, I guarantee what would happen in the, in the first few minutes. What's your name? Where are you from? Illegal. Right, <laughs> I talk right. funny. You're going to ask me that. <laughs> right? And, and all these personal questions about marital status, kids, age, it's actually someone showing interest in you most of the time. And that's the way you should handle that question. More often, it's not asked at all. So you can leave the interview and just cross your fingers and put your head in the sand like an ostrich, or you can deal with it. 
if I was coming to the end of an interview with Kevin and I felt there was an age discrimination thing like Kevin's younger than me and his staff's younger than me and I'd be the oldest person in the department by 15, 20 years and I know the interview is coming to an end when Kevin says, well, Martin, do you have any questions? I'd say, well, Kevin, if I was sitting in your shoes, I'd be looking at me and say, this guy's 15, 20 years older than the rest of my crew, and he's, uh, he's uh, 10 or 12 years older than me. And I'd like to say something about that. Number one, I've been in this business for 30 years, and I've made an awful lot of my mistakes on my payroll. And your department, no matter how well run, there are catastrophes, there are emergencies. And when those happen, I've been there before, and I won't panic, and I'm probably going to be a calming influence on the rest of the team. When you hire a younger person, should you hire a younger person, the statistics say they're going to stay with you three to four years. I'm not looking to leave in three to four years. This is a job I want. I want this job. I don't want your job, and that's another point. All these younger people working for you and that you're interviewing now, they're after your job. And if they don't get it after snapping at your heel for three or four years, they're going to leave. You hire me, I'm going to stay. And I tell you this, I think that within a year, you will recognize that I am someone you can rely on and that I am someone that you can rely on to stand at your back and not stab you in it. Now, I can go on, <laughs> but that's just an idea of some of the things we can do to deal with age discrimination. Face it full on, recognize it exists, and give some reasons where there are pluses about your age. That and a good plastic surgeon always helps. Right. right. <laughs> you know, it's, it's interesting because I, I always, <clears throat> the, the age discrimination questions when you forget about what the, what the exact question is are always coming at things from the same angle that, that, um, that individuals who are separating from the military are and that people who are looking to transition industries are and it is from a place of what they're lacking versus abundance and and by that I mean <clears throat> and it's kind of a natural tendency well I I'm having a tough time because I don't have this you know I'm, I'm too old I don't have enough experience I have different type of experience versus and, th and those are all things that you know what you're pointing out I mean fundamentally you can't change any of those right there's, the, there's not much you can do you certainly can't do anything about age if you don't have the experience the only thing you can do is go get the experience but what you do have is you have a wealth of uh, of experience in something else. You you have a number of you know soft and hard skills that that you bring to the table, and instead leverage those. And as long as those, I mean, I, I look at it pretty simply. I mean, if if those are transferable, if those things speak to, like in your case, what you're what you're laying out in the last scenario, they totally speak to what the individual is looking to hire. And if if at their core level they don't want to hire someone that is 15 years their senior because of whatever is going on inside their own head or organizationally inside the company you don't want to be there going back to what you said earlier I mean you gotta love somebody who loves you back yeah you can't do anything about it that's the right. case if I can add one other thing um, the majority of people in the last 50 years have worked for big companies that's where the majority of people have had their work experience and they find themselves, and I deal with these people all the time in our resume writing and coaching business. Um, I, I'm working with someone very recently and uh, she was vice president of global research in an industry and she was really worried. She said, I don't know how I'm going to get back in. They've abolished my job, not just at my company, but throughout the whole industry and they're just giving the jobs to younger, cheaper people and not giving them the title. Right? So these are very real things, but because we've all worked for larger companies, we forget that 80% of the growth in American jobs is in small companies, and by small companies, 500 people and less. The smaller the company, the more likely you are to be able to speak to the principal, who is more likely to be a man or woman of your age, who is more likely to be able to appreciate the fact that you can wear not one hat, but half a dozen hats. So it's a great idea to stop just relying on the job postings and take a compass and stick it in a map on your house and draw a circle around it for how far you're prepared to commute and then do the research and there's lots of tools out there and find every possible employer within reach of your house 
and then approach them directly. It's what we did as headhunters, wasn't it? <laughs> Absolutely. <laughs> you know where your territory was and you stuck inside it. <laughs> you stuck inside it. We found found a need and then we called someone who works at the company across the street and said, Hey you, do you want it if you turn left in the morning instead of right, I can get you an extra ten grand. You want to go for an interview? Right, exactly. <laughs> and then when you pulled that person out of that company, you called their boss and tried to place somebody else in there. <laughs> there you go. <laughs> the virtuous circle. Ah yes. <laughs> I'll stop there. <laughs> Otherwise, people may be <laughs> dropping off this call. So, <laughs> Kelly, what uh, what do you have next? Sure. We had a number of questions about changing career paths. Um, one in particular was, do you have any advice for senior military transitioners as they plan their transition to the private sector after they spend most of their lives in a totally different culture? Okay. Uh, Kevin, I think you're an ex-military guy. And right. I'm sure you have something to add to this. Uh, what I do when when I work with military people, whether they're senior officers or just uh, uh, lower ranks, NCOs, is pretty much the same thing. Is the big problem is we went to school and we had maybe had a mom and a dad, and and then we went to college and we got away from from for a couple of years. So we left mom and dad and went straight into the army, navy, air force, or national guard, and we have another parental figure for 10 or 20 years. And when we're coming out of the military into the civilian workforce, we really are doing a first-time job search. And we need to take all these wonderful skills we've got in the military and translate them into civilian language. I don't know how many people have heard of a little company called GE. It used to be run by a kind called Jack Welch. Jack Welch refused to have anyone in upper management who wasn't in military. The best boss I ever had um, uh, was a, a lieutenant colonel from Airborne. His last job before the sadness of having to manage me was head of officer training at West Point. Uh, you have an awful lot to offer if you're coming out of the military. The important thing is to recognize, I want a job in this sector, doing this, and you maybe have to lower your sights a little bit because you want to go for the job you can make the best argument for on paper, in person, and that when you land it, you won't trip over your shoelaces when you hit the ground running. And having done that, once you've identified the job, do some research on that job, collect the job postings, look at the responsibilities, build networks, build social networks, especially on LinkedIn, of people who hold the same job title as you, but have more experience, and the people who hold job titles that work with that job title, and the folks who have job titles one, two, and three levels above you. And then make connections with them, and for every responsibility, for example, you might have to do accounts receivable. You talk to someone who does accounts receivable and say, what are the big problems of dealing with accounts receivable? And they'll tell you, well, it's not the people who pay. What your real job is, is making sure everyone pays under 30 days. And if they go over 30 days, you have to uh, make sure they pay by 45 days. And Lord, God forbid they go over 45 days. You've got to get them to pay by 60 days. And here are some of the things you can do. Now, this goes back to what we said at the very beginning. The first thing you've got to do is find out what the customer wants and sell it to them. We're doing the intermediary step. This is what the customer wants. Let's find out what are the nuts and bolts of this responsibility. It isn't that I have six years in accounts receivable. It's that I know what the issues are and that I know the problems and how to prevent them and how to solve them. And I know the language you speak in your profession. And I don't try and do military speak on you. Back to you, Kevin. No, I think <clears throat> I think you hit on the on the biggest one, and it's that most folks in the military are not interviewing. Um, you, you are you are interviewing by virtue of your reputation and the the relationships that you have on a day to day basis. Uh, people know that you're you're good at your job. That uh, that somebody is going to want to have you on their team in the future. But the one of the things, and particularly with the site we've spun off, Every Veteran Hired, that, that I've seen <clears throat> is, you know, the, the reality is, and, th and this is difficult for a lot of folks in the military, and I say this with all the love of my heart again, but y if you've got to assimilate to the civilian sector, the civilian sector is not assimilating to you. And we've all sat in the we've all sat in the interviews where we've been asked stupid questions like, you know, I was in the infantry. Did you go in the infantry because you want to kill people? And just going back going back to your question. No, you only you. Right. Well, yeah, pretty much. <laughs> and and the 
it goes back to your your question earlier uh, that, that you brought up about age discrimination and, and you know when folks will say when individuals will say well and, and I get this all the time on webinars well the, the, legally they can't ask you that well that's not the issue the, the question's been asked the, 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 so you've got two choices either you can navigate it and educate somebody who may just quite frankly not know any better um, or make a decision that this place is is not a good cultural fit for you. But I think that I think the assimilation thing is really no different for anybody who went through, you know, whether you've gone through basic training, you've gone through ranger school, you've gone through what, whatever whatever courses you've gone through, where it's you know there's there's going to be some pain involved or deployments where it is true indoctrination by fire and you've got to change really quickly. Which oh by the way is also a phenomenal attribute to carry forward. The ability to to morph and flex with the situation, not what it should be, but what it is, and being focused on outcome. And and this is one thing I'll leave with, because <clears throat> it's something I'm exceptionally passionate about. But everyone in the military gets briefed on any mission on what the commander's intent is, and and what ultimately is the the outcome that you're seeking. And you've got to think about all these things. Particularly, we'll start with your job transition, in in those terms what absolutely has to happen and keep focused on that and whatever the quickest way is and don't, don't get distracted by all the other stuff you know people not you know, if somebody doesn't understand what it is that you did then it's a communication issue you know you've got to tighten up your message um, going into interviews that don't go well uh, you know, the, the likelihood that you're gonna have a one and done interview is slim and none you, you you are going to get beaten up and I like to remind everybody that think back to the first time you've done anything and this goes back to what you said earlier Martin about uh, particularly as men are are uh, reluctance to try new things the first time you walked you fell flat on your face the first time you swam you probably swallowed some water you know you're doing it for the first time it's not I guarantee you it's not going to go well the first few times you've got to prepare yourself for that and then you've got to learn from it and navigate from that point forward can I add a point about learning? From Absolutely. Doing, do, doing research, doing due diligence. Um, you should all be members of LinkedIn. You should be connected to Kevin. You should be connected to me. But perhaps even more importantly, let's say you're in logistics or supply chain um, and you want to work for one of the big logistics companies. On LinkedIn, you join the logistics groups. You do searches for logistics on people and you do people searches for supply chain and you look for people who have made the same transition as you who have come out of the military into that and you reach out to them they've made the change they can tell you the stumbling box they can help you avoid some of the mistakes and the last comment I'll make on this I have a book called Hiring the Best. Uh, it's been around for 27 years. It's in its seventh edition. It's in 15 languages. It's one of the acknowledged texts on employee selection, and it's taken me all around the world. And I have to tell you this. I have never, ever met a manager who was not well disposed towards military candidates. Why? Because they can take direction they know how to take the rough with the smooth and they know how to work for the good of the team and that's at the bottom of what every manager wants absolutely Kelly what do we got next sure uh, the next one is how can I make myself attractive to an employer in an industry I left many years ago and now want to return to my related accomplishments are now more than 12 years old how do I address this on my resume it's a very tough issue there's a lot of people doing this uh, and, and first of all it means number one refresh yourself about what's happening in that industry now and what the skills are and how performance is evaluated and don't go trying to sell things that no one's bought for 10 years number two you need to identify very carefully and this comes back to your resume you need to identify the key deliverables of the job if you look at a, 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 a book we have, it's called Knock 'em Dead Resume Templates. It's a full length book on resume writing, and then we have all these templates that go with it. In the text of the book, there's an example of a gallery curator. And this is someone who wanted to become a curator of a gallery, an art gallery, high end arts. 
um, he had never ever been a gallery curator. He had in fact been head of the art department of one of New York's very, very prestigious prep schools, but he never run a gallery. So what we did is we identified what were the key deliverables of being a gallery director. And the first page started with a target job title, a performance summary which talked about what he could do as it related to all the job postings we'd seen and synthesized. It had uh, 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 a key skills section which listed all the skills that a curator would have and then we had a short paragraph each on six separate topics that were critical to being a successful gallerist right the second page it listed the employers just names and dates and nothing else he used it we gave it to him one day he had an interview the day after next, they made him an offer 45 minutes into the interview, never asked him about his employment because it was clear he got what the job was about. And then in 2011, in the midst of the recession, and we know the high end of, of, of the art world goes down the toilet before anything else because it's discretionary income of the rich, right? In the middle of the last recession, because of that resume, he got called, flown to another city, got a 70% pay increase, and they relocated him, right? So it, it's going back, first of all, examine what's important to your market, find out what they're buying, retool your resume to tell the story, lead with what your great strengths are. And you use what is called a functional or a combination style, which starts off with the skills you bring to the job rather than where or when you got them. And where and when you got them is relegated to a second page or later where it's going to have less attention. Back to you. You know, I think what <clears throat> what's most interesting about everything you're saying in response to that question, again, the, the question is coming from the place of, I was, I was in this role 12 years ago. I've been out of it. I want to get back into it. How do I make what I did 12 years ago relevant? And what you're focusing in on is you, you don't. You take what you've done for the last 12 years and make it relevant towards where it is you want to go moving forward. What, what is it that you've done? And, and what, what expertise do you have? And sure, you can draw upon what happened 12 years ago, but if all your accomplishments and all your stories <laughs> are going to be drawn from 12 years ago, it's going to beg the question, you know, what, what have you been doing? How have you grown? What have you learned? Um, th th and, you know, the other, the other piece to that, because I, <clears throat> going back to the military thing, I, I did that transitioning out of the military, and it wasn't, it wasn't so much moving back into an industry I was in, but you had to take what you had and translate it to be relevant to your audience. And yeah. and and the thing that I found really interesting was, you know, the naysayers will immediately go to, well, they want somebody who has experience and they want people who come from this space and they're not going to talk to me unless I can't get interviews because they won't talk to me because I don't come from the space. Well, if that's the truth, then you never had a chance interviewing with those people to begin with. So let's just get them out of the way and don't waste any more time on them. But when you do find people that are okay with you moving from one industry to another and they're more focused on the on the outcome in the end state versus having a specific pedigree, you have a totally different conversation than everybody else who's inside the same industry trying to explain why their experience is different from one another and you're over here talking about stuff that they can't even talk about. Because you bring a wider and a different frame of reference. Absolutely. It's a, it's a well known fact that a plurality of inventions and breakthroughs are made by people on the edge of that field of expertise not people who are in the middle of it and are boxed in by the way we do things here. Right. People on the edge, those are the people who can actually see from outside the box and look at things differently. Hey Kelly, I think we've probably got time for, for one more question, maybe two. Sure. One that I saw echoed a number of times was when should you follow up if there has been no decision? And also, should you follow up if you've been rejected but you're still interested in the company? Say you were given a reason why you weren't moved ahead. Great question. Okay, okay. I, I think the, the question was actually if the headhunter tells you've been rejected. Correct. If a headhunter tells you you've been rejected, you have been rejected. Don't go around <laughs> the headhunter. 
right? He or she knows they make a buck out of getting you a deal. So be honest with a headhunter. And while we're at it, that's a, there was another question about headhunters about, what do I do when I want to know how much I made? You tell them. They can't <laughs> represent you if you don't. And never, ever lie to a headhunter. Now, going back to the follow-up point, um, it's okay. Uh, it, follow-up depends on when the decision is being made. It's different if the decision is being made tomorrow afternoon, in which case you leave, you think it through, you send an email immediately. You send them another email and you get, get them a, an overnight letter in the mail this evening. And you maybe even try and give them a call tomorrow. If it's a week from now, it's different. You send them a resume sent outside of business hours because that shows that you're thinking about the issues. And then you follow it up with a letter. You can also follow it up with a phone call. Now, if you are turned down and you have, uh, you're told, hey, we really liked you, but you came in second. There was someone that had a bit more uh, of what we needed. This happens. It happens all the time. But uh, don't let that drop. You send them a letter. Uh, uh, Dear Kevin, it was a real pleasure meeting you and the team, and I'm sorry I wasn't your top choice, um, but I was really enthusiastic about your company, and I, I think I could really make a, con a contribution in the areas of A, B, C, D, and E, and I'd love you to uh, love to keep in touch. Hope you'll keep my resume on file, and think of me next time a position opens up. Do that. Then you send them not every week, once every six or seven months. You send the next thing you send them, you send them a cartoon and you send it in the mail, <laughs> right? So you get a break from the computer, they open the envelope and there's a cartoon with a little yellow post-it. Hey, Kevin, thought this would give you a giggle. I still intend to be your next uh, logistics specialist. Best regards, Martin Yates. And then the one after that, you send them something, uh, maybe an article uh, about the company or something that's of interest. And you switch it between email and regular mail. Regular mail gets open more than email these days. Back to you, Kevin. Yeah, I think that's such a great point. It's, <clears throat> it's so much easier to stand out with physical mail. Um, the, than it is with uh, with with email, but you know the, the the great examples that you gave, and then we'll take one more question. Um, the reality is, you just you're letting people know that once once you've passed that point where they may not give you something, that you're continuing to think about them, and you're making it all about them, and and. And I mean, fundamentally, that's what that's what relationships are about. That uh, you're considering other people, and you're considering other people's needs, and you're in tune with other people's needs. So I think I think it's exceptionally important. Kevin, Kevin I'm just I, I just channel something from us being headhunters. It's something we always used to do as headhunters. You know, if if, they, if our clients were stupid enough not to hire my guy, right? Which they were once in a while. I would find out when the start date was for the new guy. And the day, the afternoon of the start date, or the next morning, they would get a call. Hi, Kevin, it's Martin Yates. Um, I was working on that assignment for a senior marketing VP a few weeks ago for you. The guy was meant to start today. How's it going? Nine times out of ten, were, it would be, well, he started. It's too early to tell yet. But one time out of ten, it would be, he turned the bloody offer down. He got a counter offer. Absolutely. <laughs> and we were right in with another search, right? <laughs> So you should follow up. When you get turned down, people get counter offers. They get better offers elsewhere. They don't always show up. And there's a window of time when there isn't a job posting out there, recruiters weren't working on it, no one else is aware of the job. And you can jump in again and uh, remind them of your candidacy and having thought about the things that went well and the things that went poorly and do some retooling on the things you didn't do so well I've known people, a number of people get the job on the rebound. No, it's a, it's a great example. And, and going back to the comment you made earlier about, you know, a headhunter tells you it's done, it's done. Sometimes when you feel like you're getting strung along by a headhunter, <clears throat> and, and some will do this more artfully than others, uh, and, and sometimes it's frustrating and sometimes it's not, but <clears throat> in many cases, pe the headhunter is keeping you warm because they're not sure if that person is going to start. They're not sure if that person's going to take the job. And they don't want to tell you no, they don't want you, and then come back and say yes, they do. It's, it's it, flipping that switch 
psychologically with somebody is much more difficult than than navigating the it's taken a while because people have been out people you know whatever the case may be now there's an offer um, so so have some patience and you know never lose sight of the fact not to make this all about headhunters but <laughs> don't lose sight of the fact that these guys can only be so transparent with you because they are they're getting paid by these companies to find people. I mean, it's, that's the whole reason I started Career Attraction initially, is that I wanted to do for people what I was able to do as a headhunter for companies and, and be more transparent with individuals. Um, so, you know, just bear, bear that in mind. I think we've got time. We can probably squeeze in one more question really quickly. Sure. Kelly, tee, tee um, it up. <laughs> not to make it all about headhunters, but I, I like this one that came in. Someone wants to know, regarding headhunters, how do you get their attention effectively? They haven't had any takers on their outreach attempts to date. Okay. You, Kevin, or me? Uh, go, go for it. All yours. Okay. First of all, if you're not getting attention, number one, uh, de dealing with a senior guy a few weeks ago and I asked him what he'd done with about headhunters and he said, oh, um, uh, I've got a guy at Egon Zender, top searchman. Well, he could have said Hydric and Struggles or anyone else. And I went, ah. And, and what people don't realize is that, especially at the senior levels, if you have a headhunter at a Hydric and Struggles or a senior retained search firm and they have taken your resume out of the database, Number one, they're going to try and get you to take the job in Bad Axe, Michigan that no one else will take first. <laughs> right? Number two, they're not going to put you back in the database until they've rung the opportunities dry for you. Which means that number three, no one else in the search firm can see that resume until I release it because the headhunting firm doesn't want their clients' offers to be rejected. Make sense? And what was the first part of the question that I was meant to ask? Answer, but didn't. <laughs> it was it was just how to get their attention initially. Okay, if, if you're not getting their attention, you got to go back, think of the job you're after, compare your resume as it stands today with half a dozen resumes for that job, and I guarantee you, you'll find that your resume is talking about the things that you think are important rather than the things that the employers are telling you that are important. So number one, redo your resume. Make it productive so it'll get pulled out of databases so that recruiters can see in a quick six-second scan um, uh, that it's relevant, and that's why at Knock and Dead we do resumes in a certain way so they pass that scan, and so they'll also read intelligently to a hiring manager. And having done that, you don't go after one. You know, a headhunter, I would tell you, Kevin would tell you, everyone else, hey, you got me, you don't need anyone else. Uh, that was in our best interest. That's in a headhunter's best interest. They don't want you to working with others. From your point of view, it's a numbers game. I talk about in my books, there's five major job hunting tactics. One of them is headhunters. I say for half a day, twice a week, you should be reaching out, doing Google searches, looking in the headhunter databases, and reaching out to headhunters, getting your resume out there. They don't find you jobs. All they're interested in is if you fit a need. And the more Absolutely. visible and discoverable you are with your resume and with your LinkedIn profile, making sure your LinkedIn profile is optimized so that it has the keywords in the right places that recruiters are using to do searches, then you're going to become more visible to them. You know, I think of <clears throat> I think of the people who stood out to me and they're they're you know, one I would tell folks that <clears throat> There wasn't a time. There was a time not too long ago where sending an unsolicited resume into a retained search firm would get you nowhere. They wouldn't even accept it. That has changed, but it's exceptionally hard to stand out. So, a, go to people who you know who have relationships. Ask your peers. Ask folks that you worked with um, in the past. Worked for in the past. Uh, assuming that you don't want your current employer to know that you're talking to a search firm, <laughs> and and ask them who they have a relationship with and get an introduction. When you get that introduction with them, you make you make it exceptionally tight. Like Martin said, I mean, we got paid on production, so unless we have something for you, having that, having a, a 30 minute to an hour long conversation when we've got nothing for you is not going to happen. And if somebody's willing to take that time, I will tell you right now, I'm not even going to mince words, they suck at what they do. There is no way they're going to spend that time with you because that is revenue producing. So you keep it really tight. You send them something that says, hey, like here, here are some key accomplishments. Like Martin's been saying throughout this whole thing, lined up with 
where you're going, you know, what you can do, and you make sure that you close with this. And this is essential to getting on to the to the next part, which I will tell you. This is how you get headhunters to call you. You say, <clears throat> "I'm out there actively networking. I'm building relationships. You know, I'm serious about my search. I'm sure you have things that are maybe a one-off, but are kind of you know." somewhere around my my wheelhouse however you want to however you want to position it when you have those searches if you have them now let me know i'm glad to help you tap into my network and make introductions with other top performers oh, they yes. will call you because i and i'm sure martin had the same thing i had a short list with every single search that i had with anywhere between 15 to 20 folks who i knew it's good people no good people and i called them so what did they get they get Kevin Kermis calling them at least once or twice a week, but they've got right of first refusal on every single search that I get. Yeah, Kevin, you are so right. This is great advice. Whenever you get a chance to help a headhunter, you do it, and they will help you in return. I know in my personal experience, you know, you would come across jobs that you didn't have a search for, and you pass it on to the people that helped you. Absolutely. Yeah, that, that was that was me clapping in the background, by the way, when you were talking, Kevin. <laughs> no, it's a it's a great point. I mean, and and the unintended consequence of this with folks who are really good is exactly what you're saying. So in many cases, you know, you may not they may not even have a search, but they've heard of something, or maybe they've got a competitor who's got a lock hold on something, and they want to get you in there just to make sure that the competitor is not. Getting the search, you know, or, or getting the fee. I don't, you know, I, I don't know that. I don't know that I was ever that petty about it. But the, the reality is, they're going to help you if if you are making referrals to people and making referrals to headhunters. And I'm not talking the folks who who are are recruiters and all they do is they focus on the internet and they say, send me your resume and I'll send it over to the client and tell you what they think. I did not, and and <laughs> like the true colors are going to come out. I didn't care what my clients thought. They're paying me 30% of your base salary to find them the right fit. I did not send resumes to get people interviews. I would pick up the phone. I'd say, Martin, you told me you're looking for a controller who has X, Y, and Z experience. I just sat down with Kelly. Let me tell you about Kelly. I think you should sit down and meet with her. What does your schedule look like next week? And when, when I would ever get pushback from people on that, and, and from clients initially, first of all, it would happen once because I would say, look, if I waste your time, you're never taking my phone call again. My goal here is to expedite your search and put the best possible athlete in front of you. And I'm telling you, if, if you're talking to recruiters, headhunters, whatever, who don't do that, they send a resume and ask for permission, they're no good at what they do. They're no good at what they do. And it is a lucrative business, folks. The first time Martin and I spoke, and I told him what I used to do, and that I switched and I started this company. He's like, "Why did you do that? <laughs> what were you thinking?" <laughs> so, um, I'll close. I'll close out with that, unless you've got anything to add, Martin. Um, the one thing I'd add: we, we've been talking about headhunters for five or ten minutes, and it's great if you can get representation by a headhunter. Um, most of the time, you won't. Don't invest your time in passive job search activities. The best way to get a job is to identify all the employers in your target geography that you can reach in a reasonable commute. Identify the job titles of the people you can hire you. Google those companies and titles and Google media them and, and cross-reference with your social networks. Find those names. Send them a resume by email. Send them a resume by mail follow up with the phone call and you're going to triple and quadruple your chances of getting interviews and then you move on to the challenge of turning job interviews into job offers. Hey Martin, this has been great. Thank you so much for coming on and uh, and sharing your insight and I, I hope that folks are going to take your advice away, put it to work and uh, accelerate their job search. Kevin, it's been my pleasure. Really enjoyed this hour. Thank you so Absolutely. much. God bless everybody. Good luck. Take care.